this evening with teacher and screenwriter Tom Phelan. Tom, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. Uh, Tom is our co-moderator for the evening, and we will certainly have a lot to talk about. Uh, but before we uh, <clears throat> get things rolling, let's take care of the housekeeping. A uh, couple notes in terms of how we'll run this uh, session. First off, please keep your audio muted if you are not speaking. Now, if you have a question or a comment to share, please use that raise hand function. You can find that icon at the bottom of the screen, as you see on the slide here. Uh, we'll call on folks in the order that those hands go up. Once you've been called on, please unmute yourself and share your remarks. And when you finish speaking, don't forget to mute yourself once again. Now, you can also use the chat function to share your thoughts and questions. We're going to be keeping our eye on uh, that box, and we're going to do our best to bring uh, those remarks into the conversation. And hey, if you're joining us for the first time, well, I hope that you will use the chat to introduce yourself and tell us where you're coming from. So, okay, let's get down to business, and we'll see. I uh, that we'll see who has a comment, and I see we have our first hand from the Glussmans. Hello, David and Janice. Please unmute yourself, and looking forward to hearing what's on your mind. Good evening, Jacob. It's good to see you again, and uh, Tom. It's good to. Uh, uh, meet you because I don't think we've seen you or met. Um, nice to meet we you. Saw the, we thank you. We we saw the Big Lebowski. I think it was when it came out. I uh, neither of us was sure, and we remembered certainly some of it. But I guess more important was seeing it a second time. You look at different things and you get hit by different things. And certainly, anytime we prepare for um, this interaction. We look at every movie a little differently. Um, uh, Tom, as a screenwriter, and since both of you are so into film and minutia, a fun fact, um, when uh, Jesus or Jesus uh, is bowling and he's uh, uh, taunting them, uh, he has, I believe it's three uh, bowling rings on one hand. And one of the scenes zooms in a bit. And I recognize that the 300 game red stone ring is absolutely accurate because my little brother has one that he earned in league play so i was able to look at that and say wow they really got this right they either replicated it or went out and borrowed one for the filming but just one of those little little details that these filmmakers get so right so often um i, I sort of was thinking about the 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 whole idea of some of the what apparently are the uh, inspirations, uh, Jeff Dowd, et cetera, and, and the idea that art imitates life in, in this piece of this otherwise, uh, I guess I'll say one step short of absurd, wonderful comedy. Um, in the middle of all of the tumult in the scene with, uh, one of the scenes with Joanne Moore, Jeff, uh, well, uh, the dude gives his background with, with, effectively having formed the SDS, which for some of us on, on this call are old enough to remember all of that actually happening. Um, I, I just thought that throwing that in in the middle of this was was just fun. Uh, I thought that the dream or interlude scenes when he was either too drunk or got bopped on the head or whatever were so entertaining and so well done in almost a completely different film fashion than most of the rest of the film. And I guess I'll, I'll leave that as my sort of lead for the two of you to discuss how the Cone brothers sort of do this, I'm gonna call it a juxtaposition. I'll, I'll let you decide what it is between this very gritty reality for most of the film. And then these, uh, Janice called them dream sequences. I. I, I wrote down, uh, you know, entertaining interludes. Um, and uh, thanks for bringing another great opportunity to think about a film, either a new film or in this case, think about it differently. Thanks, David. Always great to hear from you. And uh, nice to see you too, Janice. Um, you've touched on a, a number of interesting subjects. Um, first of all, I was glad that you brought up the dude's uh, passed in the student movement of the 1960s. Um, I think that is uh, 
uh, an interesting element of the film and one that you know deserves some exploration. But you also talked about the juxtaposition of the different elements in the film, both in terms of the sort of reality and fantasy, as it were, and the sort of grittiness of the mystery or ostensible grittiness with the absurdism and uh, and playfulness of the film. Um, so uh, lots to talk about there. Tom, uh, what do you think? Oh yeah, I think that's a great uh, great place to start because you know a lot of this they, there's there's a lot of juxtapositions happening in the film, and uh, I think in in general the Coen brothers like to establish something and then undermine it, and the film starts with uh, a reveal. You know, you start with the desert. We think, oh, are we? And the music is kind of cues us to think, oh, are we watching a western? Uh, and then you have that, you know, that great shot of L.A. being revealed. Uh, the tumbleweed takes us into that shot. Um, so I think you're on to something when you're talking about the dream sequences versus the the grittiness of what's going on, because uh, we're in this film noir world. And uh, there, there are certain, there's a sort of a trope that happens in a lot of noir movies, especially ones from the 40s, where the the private eye gets knocked out and that's always a kind of an easy device for any writer to use when they want to end a scene um you know Tolkien does it all the time too in, in his novels um what's interesting that the Coen brothers actually find a way to fill that space and actually uh take it somewhere else instead of just cut and then here's the next part of you know here's the next part of the story the next event and they just explore this uh, dream world, which is, uh, you know, whether it's his his fantasy or his dream. Um, and they they do this throughout the film. And I think one way we can also explore um, the differences in the way these worlds look, because you can compare on one hand, as you said, the gritty world, you've got uh, kind of a dingy little apartment that the dude lives in. But then you've got the bowling alley, which is all color. And then you've got these dream sequences, which are, you know, brightly lit. So. What do you think, Tom, about the uh, the student activism of the dude? We learned that he helped author the Port Huron statement, that he's this sort of former, uh, former, I guess, hippie or peace activist. How does that figure in? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. You know, the dude... We don't get much backstory on the dude, but I think, um, you know, throughout this film, there is a sort of reality that is it is sort of bubbling beneath all of the fun and all of the absurdity. And it's only really alluded to, um, you know, for you have the shots of, uh, you know, uh, of George Bush, Bush Sr. early on. And you've got the sense of serious things happening just beyond the frame. And I think it's funny how we always talk about the dude as this laid back guy who, you know, doesn't engage, but there's a sense that he has a, uh, has a, has a life that uh, happened before. So we're sort of asked to wonder, uh, was he, what happened to make him like this? Did he make a conscious choice? Did he give, did he resign himself? Uh, but I think, by mentioning his past in these scenes were, were kind of left wondering. And I think you're meant to wonder about it. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, one thing that, you know, we're told from the beginning of the film is that the dude is a man for his time and place. And that time and place actually is the early 90s, which is where the film sets it, or that, that that's uh, the moment which is referred to, not not actually the 1960s. So I think, you know, one thing that we can continue to explore over the course of our discussion is, you know, how is this film uh, treating that period, that sort of interregnum between the Cold War and, you know, 2001 onward, 9-11 onward, really? Um, and also, why is the dude the man for that time and place? But one element of it, I think, that is worth putting on the table is that, you know, um, uh, I think one thing that the film is dealing with is, I guess, a sort of assessment by, you know, the Coens of their own generation, you know, of the sort of ambitions of the boomers, which seem to have, you know, at least in the case of the dude and in Walter, to some extent, too, have turned away from, I don't know, dreaming of another vision of society and have kind of gone into, I don't know, a sort of... Uh, 
uh, a kind of drift in the present and a sort of nostalgia, you know, for the dude, it's, it's uh, maybe his student days as a, as an activist trying to change the world. And, you know, Walter's version of it might be Vietnam. So that's, that's an element that we can um, uh, talk about more. Um, now, I see that we have another hand up, and it's our old friend Gus Cillian. Gus, great to see you. Uh, please unmute yourself. Looking forward to hearing what's on your mind. Yeah, I, I kind of would like to uh, follow up with what uh, you were just talking about uh, in terms of um, all the emasculation uh, references in the film. I mean, uh, even the song, the Bob Dylan song, I think it is, The Man in Me. And uh, the, uh, the Big Lebowski himself is like when he's facing the fireplace talking about, you know, what should a man do and all that. And then you have these these references to, uh, you know, uh, the dudes worrying about his, uh, you know, losing his Johnson and all that stuff. And uh, again, you have Walter, you know, worrying about, you know, uh, basically the failure of Vietnam. And I'm just wondering if if all those emasculation things have to do with maybe they feel that they've been unmanned by their past, by, by what's happened to them after their ideals happened, you know, in the past. And, uh, you know, the current situation they have, it almost is like, like they've, uh, you know, been castrated, you know, uh, I guess in their character, not just physically. That's very perceptive, Gus. I think you've introduced a very important element of the film, you know, which is a sort of, uh, it, it certainly is a film occupied with masculinity and maybe we can go as far as to say a crisis of masculinity. Uh, Tom, any thoughts on that? Oh uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's a really good comment. And I think it's, um, I think it's something that the Coen brothers are, are playing with. You know, they, they like to take old classical Hollywood film genres and, and kind of inject different ideas into them. And I think, you know, this is a like a film noir, if you think of a film noir Marlowe character. Um, and I think that um, in this case, you know, well, Phil Marlowe is, you know, you, when we think of him as a solitary male hero who's never going to get married, he's never going to be a father, he's always going to be this sort of slumming angel character. But I think they're sort of poking fun at that because uh, the dude is never in the kind of control that Marlowe has, even though Marlowe's control is somewhat limited, he's always getting kicked around, but he's kind of, he reasserts his control in a lot of situations that the dude will never really have that control over. And, you know, there's, there are no women who are falling over themselves to be close to the dude. And he's, uh, you know, he's manipulated by Maud, you know, in, in a fairly transactional friendly way, but she's very much in control and not attracted to him. So um, I think there is a masculinity in crisis uh, element here. And I think in a lot of ways, the real relationship in the movie is between Walter and, and the dude and, and Donnie. So it ends up being, I think one of the main uh, so one of the main takeaways for me for this film is it's really a story about male friendship, I think, which is not what we, the, we do see that in The Long Goodbye, uh, but I don't think we've seen it in quite this way. You know, uh, Joel Cohen said that uh, the relationship between Walter and the dude is supposed to be a dysfunctional marriage. So in, in a way, it's a kind of strange version of like the thin man. Think of like Nick and Nora Charles, for example. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a great friendship movie. Um, and I love that you, um, you know, sort of brought the noir comparison in, in into it, particularly with regard to the way that the film is dealing, you know, with masculinity. Um, you know, the uh, the classic noir detective, I mean, you, you, we've been talking about Philip Marlowe, you know, Raymond Chandler's classic detective, you know, uh, played in The Big Sleep by Humphrey Bogart, you know, um, you know, who we also know is Sam Spade, the sort of other archetypal, you know, hard-boiled private eye. Um, that's one of sort of two kind of antecedent masculine heroes, you know, that show up in the film. The other one I, I, I would suggest at least is, is maybe Sam Elliott's Cowboy. Um, you know, it, it 
kind of interesting because you know the the noir as a form sort of first in literature then in film sort of displaced the western as like the uh kind of um you know pop uh metier for uh for its time and um you know and then so here we see you know these two very sort of classical conventional versions of masculinity and then the next one in line is the dude i think there is you know an element to the film where th there is a sense there is a sort of question of like what does it you know mean to be a man in this day and age or how you know how, how do men deal with their masculinity is there some extent to which they feel you know emasculated um one moment that strikes me uh in it going back to walter is you know walter uh we we have through the whole film this sort of um you know, subcurrent of the uh, first Gulf War. And Walter uh, talks about how, you know, back in Vietnam, it was, you know, uh, that was a worthy enemy. And, and here, you know, there's not even boots on the ground. And so I wonder if there's an element where, you know, in this sort of world, in this uh, post-Cold War, you know, LA environment, where there's a sense where, I don't know, the frontier isn't really there anymore. There's no room for cowboys. And, you know, the 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 ways that um, one might have sort of asserted one's masculinity in, you know, in the 1970s by going to war. Well, that's sort of, um, at least in, you know, Walter's telling is, is sort of subsided. So where does that leave our guys? And, and I think that's a question the film is occupied with a little bit. I want to move on to a, a comment that we uh, see in the chat from Gail, who says, I am so interested in the Buddhist Zen way we all approach the dude, like Jeff Bridges' book with Bernie Glassman. Is that the dude or Jeff Bridges or the Cone brothers? So I guess the question I would put to you from there, Tom, is, you know, what is the relationship as you see it between um, Buddhism and uh, the Big Lebowski? And then by extension, is there something of that in, I don't know, the persona of Jeff Bridges as an actor or in the Coen brothers as, you know, as auteurs? Oh, yeah, that's an interesting question. I think people always try to uh, figure out what is the dude's code if, if he has one and what is the philosophy behind uh, the story. Um, for me, I, I think that I think that there is something to that idea that he's if you're talking about Buddhist ideals in terms of uh, looking at a cruel, uh, elusive world and deciding not to engage in it or to just sort of um, suffer and acknowledge the suffering and and not strive, that I think there's a lot of that in, in the dude's character. But I think the dude's character is also a continuation of... Um, a certain kind of, I, I know that the Coen brothers, they've done all their reading. So, that, you know, they're probably, they know their picaresque novels uh, and stories of, uh, of characters who are from sort of episodic stories, characters who just uh, don't engage, but just go from episode to episode trying to survive. And I feel like also connecting to what uh, Jacob was saying earlier, there's a sort of a collapse of of code. Um, the Western and the and the noir film often share a character who has a code which is sort of uh, saving people and obeying your own uh, your own rules on on who gets saved and who who gets punished. I think that's completely collapsed in this world, and. And kind of uh, just like all the other Coen Brothers films, but you know Fargo, Blood Simple, I think it's actually the same bleak world that we encounter in those films. Mm. But in my, I think this might be one of the only times that I can think of when the Coen Brothers are actually suggesting a solution to that. Um, and you, you you can you can choose whether you believe it's a uh, a right solution or not. But, you know, the dude reminds me of Bartleby the Scrivener uh, from uh, Herman Melville's short story. He's a character who doesn't engage, or he says, I prefer not to. And, you know, depending on how you look at that, and coming back to the, the idea of Buddhism, um, 
sometimes not engaging in that way. And I'm, you know, probably simplifying it, but uh, that can be a sort of strength or a kind of choice, which is actually um, a productive choice. I think that's really perceptive, Tom. I mean, and it sort of gets at one of the, you know, central drives of the film, I think, which is this question of like, how do we live in this world? You know, um, uh, what is, um, uh, what is meaningful in post-modernity, you know? Um, so he, he, the, the dude is one of several people with their own sort of code in the film. We also have Walter and his sort of strange commitment to rules, although that, you know, I think we can probe that a little bit more. We have our nihilists, of course, whose, um, whose uh, code is... Um, uh, uh, having no rules or having you know, or believing in nothing, we have the Big Lebowski, um, meaning uh, Mr. Jeffrey Lebowski, the businessman, and his sort of you know um, Reaganite kind of cult of uh, achievement or ethos of achievement. You know, there's there's a funny <laughs> there's a very funny line in the movie, one of many lines in the film that is, I think. Um, seems like a throw just a like funny throwaway joke that you know upon examination i think actually has some substance to it you know which is um uh walter you know initially describes the germans as he calls them nazis and when um when it when it's explained to him that actually no these are not nazis these are nihilists uh, he <laughs> he says well, say what you will about the tenets of national socialism, at least they have an ethos, uh, <laughs> which is a preposterous thing to say. And I think we're, we're all comfortable saying uh, bad ethos, thumbs down. Um, <laughs> but but it says something about um, Walter's need for uh, for some sort of ordering principle and and ours, you know, this is one of the questions that we, you know, face as people, which is <laughs> what's right, what's wrong, what do we do, how do we act? And, you know, in this sort of absurdist movie, in this kind of nonsensical, you know, upside down farcical noir plot, we, I, I think there is an element where these characters are like grappling with like fairly profound, you know, questions of how to live. Um, Tom, I wanted to uh, ask you about the, um, the big Lebowski about Jeffrey Lebowski, you know, anytime we have a film where two characters have the same name, we know that we're, you know, that's a signal to us that these are counterparts uh, or opposites, or, you know, there, there's a tie between them, whether it's, you know, a connection or an opposition. What do you think about him? And what's the connection between him and the dude? Well, I think that, um, I think he's another example of a character who, um, and this is true for most of the characters in the film who a lot of the characters are trying to be uh, someone who, who they're not um, or they're pretending to be someone who they're not. And I think that's true from everyone from uh, maybe Alan doing his his dance quintet through, uh, you know, Walter, who is sort of pretending to be Jewish or he's converted to Juda Judaism, but he acts as if he's you know, always been in that tradition that everyone's sort of aspiring to be something else. I mean, um, and I think that the Coen brothers just like to re reveal people for who they are, not necessarily judging them. Um, but I think the big Lebowski is, you know, in a way he's the big empty. I mean, he's, 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 uh, he's embezzling from, uh, the children's fund, he married into money. And yet, you know, in the beginning, he's presented as uh, maybe somewhat a character who's more uh, straightforwardly presented in the big sleep. You know, you have the guy in the chair in the beginning who is, who has really got a lot of money and is really very successful. But the Coen brothers are very intent on, on punching holes through all of those sorts of, uh, characters they don't leave anyone standing at the end really other than maybe the dude yeah this is a world where nobody is you know what they seem to be you know I think one of the themes in the film and one of the things that sort of um you know 
it is counterpointed against this sort of search for meaning is it's a world where it's sort of hard to tell what's up and what's down and what's what um you know some of that has to do i think with the uh um the sort of um media age that the film kind of uh you know comments of us moving into you know with the sort of early dawn of the internet age and the sort of um uh you know media spectacle era of of the 1990s and the and the gulf war and so forth um but yeah i mean i i love that you refer to him as the big empty uh one thing that i think um you know is interesting is how often he says the word achievement you know um and uh you know the cones are very very sensitive to language um uh and, and especially when you hear a character say a word again and again i think it's a flag goes up which is pay attention to this and you know it's um i i i think there is a little bit of a um you know sense of the uh hollow authority of the of the world that the that you know the big lebowski represents because you know the way he sort of poses it is that you know um success and virtue are you know the same thing you know that that he's uh uh, he's successful because he worked hard and because he's virtuous and the dude is not because he's not um you know but what we learn eventually is that what he has that what he what he has is not achievement what he has is money you know <laughs> and and wealth and achievement aren't necessarily you know the same thing so i mean i think that's um one of the uh i don't know one of the edifices or ideological structures that the the cones are sort of you know, piercing uh, and critiquing a little bit. Um, I see that we have another hand up, which is from uh, Matthew Gelfin. Uh, Matthew, please unmute yourself. Looking forward to hearing what's on your mind. Um, I have a, two points. One is just sort of a, a throwaway point. I just want to shout out um, the performance in the movie by Philip Seymour Hoffman, who plays this this solicitous um, character um, so well. And um, it's just so different from so many of the roles that Hoffman um, plays in other movies. And I just wanted to mention that because he's such an exquisite actor and I really miss having him around to make more movies because he is so good. But that's just a bit of a, a throwaway comment. But um, the more thematic comment I wanted to make is how quintessential of a Coen Brothers movie this is. Um, I think of a, a theme that runs through it that is very similar to some themes that run through um, No Country for Old Men, um, uh, Blood Simple and a couple of other of their movies. And that theme is um, the randomness of, of what happens in people's lives. Although in this case, some of the seeming randomness is actually contrived by the big Lebowski in his scheme to embezzle money and bump his wife off but so much of what happens to the dude is seeming seemingly random these two guys you know barge into his house and pee on his rug and um there's a running gag through the movie of his car getting damaged um more and more every time he gets in it um, then, uh, of course, they go to um, accost this young kid who they think stole the money. And there's this fancy red sports car sitting outside and Walter just takes a, a baseball bat to it. And it wasn't even the kid's car. It was just some random neighbor who happened to buy a new car that week. And so, ma so many other events in the movie that seem so completely random um, and yet they are critical turning points in the story critical turning points in the lives of the characters and so on and it's 
just so evocative of other of the Coen brothers movies. It seems to be a, another theme that they're very focused on. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, great comments. I love that you uh, gave a shout out to Brandt, AKA Philip Seymour Hoffman in this movie, <laughs> amazing character. <laughs> and, you know, you've also sort of raised the theme of, I don't know what, grappling with the um, random contingency of the universe, um, which certainly is a theme in Coen Brothers movies. I think of a serious man as well. Tom, let me turn things to you here. Can you speak A to uh, how you see Brandt and Philip Seymour Hoffman's performance in this film. But I'm also, I, you know, I know you're somebody who knows the Coen Brothers filmography pretty well. Tell us your thoughts about, uh, you know, uh, Matthew's point and also whether there are other through lines that you see, you know, through the filmography. Oh yeah, sure. Um, I, I think, you know, I agree. Philip Seymour Hoffman is, uh, he's, he's amazing in everything I've seen him in. I think he was part of uh, the New York troupe of actors that maybe, I think, I think he was, I, I should look it up, but I think it's called the Labyrinth Group. And he was in there with the Sam Rockwell and a bunch of other guys who kind of came up together. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's very sad that that we're, we can't see him in films anymore. Um, and Brand has <laughs> one of my favorite lines. I mean, there's so many great lines in the movie, but, uh, and this is, this is ties into the second part of the question. He says, uh, she's a wonderful woman. And he first, I if I hope I'm getting this right, I think he says it to when he's looking at the picture of Nancy Reagan. He's referring to her as a, she's a wonderful woman. And then, you know, a couple of scenes later, uh, they're talking to Bunny, and she, you know, makes an offer to the dude, and he just says the exact same phrase: "She's a wonderful woman," something like that. I hope I'm getting that right. Um, and that ties into I think your your great comment about. Uh, Cohen brothers uh, talking about contingency and and fate and also the inability of the human beings to navigate it very well. Um, and I think one of the through lines throughout their work is the failure of human beings to communicate. Especially, you'll see it in. Uh, I always come back to Blood Simple because I, I love Blood Simple, but that's another that's a film where if if one or two of the characters simply said one or two sentences, there would be no drama. That none of this would have happened. Um, but everyone's so trapped in their own uh, sort of private worlds and their own ideas of of how what the other person wants that they would never stop and ask them. And I think you see the same thing um, in all of these films. Uh, so many mistakes are made because someone hears something wrong or they hear something in, in a way that uh, only they would hear it. Um, and I think that plays out in this film in particular with, um, I, I mentioned this in the intro, this, there's a lot of repetition in this film of the exact same phrases, sometimes by the same character, sometimes by a different character. And the dude does it throughout where he picks up, you know, this aggression will not stand, he says, or he repeats Maud, he says, in the common parlance. Um, he says, interesting sort of mim mimicry that um, it, it makes it ju just like when you hear a phrase repeated over and over in real life, it starts to it stops making sense. I think there's some of that in this film. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Coen brothers are not fans of uh, Harold Pinter, who mm -hmm. was a uh, really wonderful uh, playwright who also adapted a lot of films uh, for the for a lot of adapted a lot of stories to uh, to the big screen. And he does the same thing of where he takes really simple phrases and he repeats them, he repeats them. And each time they have a different meaning. Um, so I think that's that's one of the main through lines. And the other one is just uh, we're in this absurd world. We're not very good at at making decisions because we don't think them out. I mean, look at Fargo. Again, he, everyone in that film makes a, a decision that if they really sat down to think about it, they would see all the terrible ways it would it would go wrong. Um, so I think that that's that's the through line. And but I also think 
there is actually a, there is a warmth in their films that if you're looking for it, you'll find it. And I would compare it to, you know, if you compare them, to, for example, to Mel Brooks on one hand with comedy, you know, he he I don't I don't know that he has these warm moments because it's just gags mostly. Um, and I love his films, too. That's you know, that's just the way he sees the world. And then on the other hand, you have Stanley, Stanley Kubrick, who has all the irony and he has a lot of the distance that the Coen brothers are um, sometimes negatively associated with. Um, but they also have these moments of uh, of quiet connection, you know, whether it's Marge in, you know, in bed with her husband, just watching TV and or it's um, that kind of flash forward in raising Arizona of, of just imagining uh, a family together. Or in this film, it's it's uh, one of my favorite moments in this film is when they're facing the nihilists and Walter uh, says in a very gentle voice to Donnie, uh, these men, so I, I hope I get it right, but these men are nihilists, don't worry, they're cowards, something along those lines. And there's actually something very touching about that. Thanks, Tom. Just they don't indicate these emotional moments as as uh, emphatically as as most Hollywood films would. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're going to move on to our next hand in just a moment, but I wanted to quickly read a comment from Gus in, in the chat, which I think is apropos. Gus writes, the word abides uh, can come from Ecclesiastes. Things come and go, but the earth continues. So does the dude and his offspring will continue his way. So let's move now to David Burns. David, please unmute yourself and uh, please share your question. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you, hello. Okay. Um, two quick ones. The When you were talking about the nihilist, I thought you were gonna say the hilarious response. I think it's by uh, Jeff Bridges. That must be exhausting. I love that. <laughs> um, but. <laughs> We say that all the time in our family. Um, I read a little interview with Jeff Bridges recently, and um, they asked him if he got stoned for some of the scenes. And his answer was fascinating. He said, absolutely not. And he said, that screenplay, people don't, people assume it was like a lot of improvising. He said, every jot and tittle and note and comma and pause was absolutely spelled out perfectly. And I thought, wow, that's fascinating. And uh, he said he said he would ask the Coen brothers before a scene, would the dude be high in this scene? And sometimes they go, yeah, probably. So <laughs> so he would kind of act like he was stoned, but he said, uh, he said, no, never, never lit one up to film the movie. It was hilarious. <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, it, funny, we were we were talking, you know, before uh, we we went live here about just how uh, clinically assembled the the script is. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, you're a screenwriter yourself, so you you probably have a good sense of you know structure. Can you talk a little bit about you know the way the Coen Brothers structure their screenplay, and if there's you know anything that uh, you know how do they put it together that makes it you know both feel sort of so loose but also hold together the way it does. Uh, yeah, well, I, I think the I think the key may be the phrase you just used, uh, not well, not hold together, but tie together. <laughs> it all starts, <laughs> it starts with this rug. And it ties the room together. <laughs> it ties the room together, yeah. I think that, you know, what's interesting to me is that, you know, of course, the screenwriters, the first thing they always talk about is what's the main character's goal. And the goal for him is to just uh, get compensated for his rug, which has just been peed on. So that's the, you know, what they call, they call the inciting incident or whatever you want to call it. That's how that sort of starts the story. Um, but what's interesting to me about this film is, you know, some people think of some screenwriters talk about films as needing to be, they're like transformation machines where you start with the character who's, who's one way and we have to, uh, they have to be transformed in some important way by the end. But 
I'm not I'm not convinced that that's really what happens here. Um, so that's that's one thing when I think about the script and how it's structured. And actually, I'm just remembering. Uh, I know that Jacob, you mentioned you're a fan of the movie Naked by Mike Lee. I think that's another that's another example of a film where a character doesn't change. Uh, and so when you're doing that kind of film, I think your goal is to change the audience. The audience is the one who are the ones transformed by the end of the picture. And usually it's because the main character hasn't been transformed. Um, and in this case, it's just a, a character who's abided. But in terms of the structure, I think they just followed a, I mean, it's a very twisty film. It's hard to uh, extricate exactly what happens, but it does hold up if you sit down and, and write down the, the beats and the events. But I think they just structured it according to a an, uh, any kind of noir uh, film where they're sort of uncovering who did what. But um, I think the through line is just is the character. And I think I think the real climax of the film is the death of Donnie. So if it's really uh, respecting a, a structure, I think the structure is actually the relationship between the three guys, uh, because the other main goal is to win, win at bowling, you know, so there's another goal, right? So you have these two stories that are, uh, are meshing, but I think the, you know, the emotional climax of the story is the loss of Donnie. And it's done in this really interesting sort of sleight of hand where you don't know that that's the heart of the story until it happens. And I don't, I don't know if I'm the only one, but I was, I'm actually very moved by, uh, you know, as silly as it is with the, you know, the point doom uh, spreading of the ashes and it, you know, comes out of the urn and everything. I mean, it's very funny, but there's, you know, it's, it's also sort of moving because there, you know, there's one final blow up on Walter and, you know, they just have this hug and, you know, I think that that's, there's two structures going on, I think. One's emotional and one's more of a, a kind of noir narrative that, that we're familiar with. Yeah, I, I'm glad you, you you began your comments with the rug because, you know, one of the, um, you know, tools that we've come to recognize in many noir and thriller narratives, what they call the MacGuffin, you know, which is the thing that everybody's after, you know, but that in it of itself, it's not actually that meaningful. It's just like yeah. kind of there to... Um, uh, to get the plot moving and to be a sort of um, magnet for the narrative action to sort of move towards um, the the most classic one being the Maltese Falcon, um, but here it's <laughs> yeah. here it's the dudes rug, which really did tie the room together. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I read that the Cone Brothers, you know, described their intention for the film as you know structuring it like a noir narrative where there's lots of interesting incidents and strange characters and a very convoluted plot but uh but you know the plot itself is not really the point as much as sort of exploring the world and exploring the characters as you uh touched on tom in fact you know we've been talking about the big sleep uh the howard hawks you know classic era noir featuring uh humphrey bogart um as a sort of reference point and as a point of interest there's a famous um, anecdote where um, William Faulkner, who was working on the uh, screen adaptation um, of The Big Sleep from Raymond Chandler's novel, uh, 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 in a uh, uh, in a panic, wired Chandler in the middle of the night, you know, asking, you know, wait a minute, who killed so and so, and you know, in scene X, and Chandler responded that he actually wasn't sure, you know, who killed that character. But it doesn't really matter, you know. The plot, the the the, <laughs> it's it's um, it, it's a through the looking glass story, and and the the point is going through the looking glass. Yeah, I was going to mention that exact story. That's a great story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's great. Also, uh, the final point of interest in Barton Fink, the Cone Brothers, you know, basically have a character who's a stand-in for William Faulkner during his time in Hollywood. So that's certainly an anecdote that they would have been, you know, aware of. Oh, yeah. Now, I'm going to move to a, uh, a comment um, down here in the chat where uh, Matthew writes, I think Walter transforms towards the end of the movie. He is clearly moved by Donnie's passing. 
Despite his bombast all through the movie, his eulogy is partly touching and in the end initiates a hug with the dude. And then Michael uh, comments as a follow-up. Uh, the death of Donnie was the first time we see Walter differently. Everything is still about Vietnam, but his emotional connection to Donnie and his humanness is evident. So, you know, we haven't talked about Walter that much, who's mm. I, one of the, you know, most memorable characters in the film, maybe one of the most memorable characters in any film. What do you think about him? How does he fit into all this, Tom? Uh, well, you know, I know he was based on a, a couple of characters, but I always think of John John Milius just because I've, you know, I've seen him in interviews. There's a great documentary about him. And for anyone who doesn't know, John Milius, uh, he wrote the original draft of Apocalypse Now, though it changed a lot. He did, he directed uh, Conan the Barbarian. And he's, he was just a larger than life uh, character. One of the, I think he was one of the film school guys in LA, kind of in the same group with everybody, like from Coppola to uh, George Lucas and everyone. And, you know, he was a, he, he was a gun nut and, he, oh, he was famous for Red Dawn too. I believe he did that movie. Um, <laughs> And he was a gun nut, but he was a surfer. He was a very complicated guy. You never know how much was just kind of posturing, but he was, he was one of the models for Walter. And many people have said John Milius was, you know, uh, his, uh, was actually a fairly gentle guy if he got past that stuff. Um, so I, I feel like that's, you know, Walter is a guy who's just very explosive, but there's a great line one of the Coen brothers said that he's he's an angry person, but it's all residual. He doesn't carry it with him or he's not. It's not residual. I think they said like he just blows up and then it's and then it's gone. You know, one of my favorite scenes, and this is very much a part of the of the Coen brothers style. They like to have uh, explosive character moments followed by extreme calm it's when he destroys the car and then you just cut to them you know eating the uh in and out burger <laughs> in the back seat as if it as if nothing <laughs> nothing ever happened and again you know going back to that buddhism thing uh, i think it's i feel like what's interesting about walter and the dude and we don't learn much about donnie but you know they they make plans to get money and they kind of dream about uh, uh, doing well, but they forget about this stuff almost immediately. Right. So they're not really attached to this stuff. I mean, you know, they think that the they've got a money, uh, a suitcase full of money in the car and yet they go bowling. So <laughs> right. that's what differentiates them from the other characters is ultimately they do more pleasure and, and their little blow ups with each other. Uh, and yeah, I guess that's my main thing with Walter. He's all, you know, he's basically a gentle guy who's you know, trapped in his own little, uh, he's got his own hobby horses like everyone in the story, but ultimately he's got a good heart. You know? <laughs> yeah, I love Walter. One of the things that um, I think is so intriguing about him is that, you know, although he is in many ways kind of the same persuasion as the dude in terms of kind of the position he occupies and in the world and the way he moves through it. He also, you know, we, we've talked about characters tr trying to find their own codes and their own sort of organizing principles. And Walter is obsessed with rules, you know, um, and he, he his blowups usually um, pertain to uh, people not following the rules. There's even a point where he says, am I the last person who cares about the rules? Um, but but the rules are almost always be, like sort of arbitrary and abstract and don't, you know, actually correspond <laughs> much <Yeah>. to, <laughs> to, to like, you know, uh, I, I don't know, uh, maybe even a morality or a sort of, <laughs> or a sort of ideal or something like that. Like he, he, he is, he, <laughs> he is pretty unfocused in that way. Um, you know, I think for example, you know, he takes, um, uh, he takes like a personal offense in the idea that uh, Bunny might, you know, uh, uh, play everybody for fools and fake her own kidnapping and and get one over on everybody. And so he, you know, kind of as a response to that, contrives a plan to a, a absurd plan, but a plan to <laughs> to steal a million dollars. <laughs> so it, I mean, it's not exactly like um, 
a white hat position. I, I'm glad you mentioned Apocalypse Now, too, because one of the other genres that um, uh, the Coens are playing with here, not as much as they are with the Western and with uh, the noir, but but that's in the mix, I think is like the Vietnam movie. And the place where I think of it the most, I mean, this is this this is a film with an absolutely classic soundtrack, great needle drops. And there's a point where they are off to, um, you know, uh, deliver the money, you know, or deliver the ringer, as it were. And Walter has his plan where he's going to, you know, uh, trap one of the kidnappers and beat the whereabouts of Bunny out of him. And then what comes on the soundtrack is um, Creedence Clearwater Revival's Run Through the Jungle, which is also a song in Apocalypse Now. <laughs> so, oh, I didn't know that. That's it. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's a little bit of a <laughs> a wink there. Like, like. Oh, that's but, great. Yeah. It's also like you know we were talking about I don't know the legacy of Vietnam. You know, for these characters, a sort of loss of masculinity or something, or the the sort of strange position of masculinity for these guys in this new mm-hmm. world. And like, this is their Vietnam. <laughs> sort yeah. Of. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, and I, I think that, well, I mean, that's another common thing in, in well, the original the original noir films, you know, these were post-war heroes that came back and they were lost. And and then in the 70s, they did it again, um, like Taxi Driver or um, what's the other Paul Schrader one? The guy with the hook, I can blank oh, on uh, it. Rolling Thunder. Thunder, yeah. So, you know, maybe I think Walter probably sees himself as one of these characters but i think what's interesting too is you know it, this is the 90s uh, one of the hallmarks for me of the 90s i've seen this someone else came up with this but you know talking about how in the 90s everything was well it's just postmodernism. everything was getting uh it was all about references you know it was mst3k and it was um you know jokes about jokes, it was reality bites. And there was just this sort of, not everywhere, but that was some part of the culture. And so it was sort of impossible to be, um, to to adopt one role for too long. So I feel like, and especially in the Coen Brothers films where they're jamming together, you know, Busby Berkeley and, and, and Chandler and, you know, real, you know, Iraq stuff, like all this stuff is just in this, heady brew um yeah it's a a very unique thing and i think that for me it it makes it reminds me of this uh there's this article by david foster wallace where he was talking about the irony of the 90s and how do you find meaning and how do you how do how do you how can you be sincere in that kind of a thing and i feel like walter's this character who is trying desperately to find meaning. There's actually a great line in the script when he, you, someone mentioned the, the line about, oh, these, these people are, uh, they're nihilists. And there's this line that doesn't, isn't in the movie. It's just, a, it's, you know, it's in the script. It says, Walter looks haunted. And I think it's <laughs> you know, highlighted. It, it highlights his character. He's a guy who, like you said, he's, he wants rules and he wants to be a certain thing, but life won't won't cooperate with him and he's very yeah. sentimental too he, he he converted to judaism but his his wife who was jewish is out of his life and he's still obsessed with her and you know he's he just won't move on yeah some of walter's funniest moments are when he's sort of trying to embody like two different kinds of identities like at the same time like <laughs> i i think of when he like um uh he, he, it's in his maybe his first scene where he's like saying, uh, sometimes you have to draw a line where you do not pass. And then he like immediately interrupts himself to like, you know, um, lecture the dude on, uh, you know, Chinaman is not the preferred nomenclature and so forth. So, I mean, it's it's one of the juxtapositions that the Coens are working with. Uh, we do have a couple more hands. I wanna make sure we get to them before we're out of time tonight. Let's go to Mark Kennedy. Uh, Mark, please unmute yourself and tell us what's on your mind. Well, I was thinking about bowling, of course, and uh, <laughs> you know, bowling holds them the, all the characters together, uh, and in the rest of their lives, they're not achievers. Uh, but in bowling, they're achievement oriented. They're tr- more traditional. They follow the rules, um, and they want to be winners. I mean, the dude is even lying at home listening to bowling. 
So uh, it, it's kind of a counterpunch to the rest of the way the movie went. What do you think about the role in uh, bowling in the film, Tom? And thanks for your comment, Mark. I'm glad that you brought sure. that to the table. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, right on. I mean, I think that uh, everything else, well, a lot of a lot, a lot of the bowlers, at least the ones we meet, are sort of outsiders, and they've found this way to come together. And, you know, this, this film is shot by Roger Deakins, who's one of the great cinematographers, and he he really creates this fantasy space inside the bowling alley. I mean, it looks like a bowl. Of course, bowling alleys are well lit, but uh, I compare it to, you know, he uses neon. Um, he didn't shoot Blood Simple, but I think of, you know, the neon and Blood Simple where it's neon and surrounded by shadow. This is like neon and everything's well lit and everything's kind of an escape from the the grittiness and the, you know, even though it's a comedy, it is sort of a bleak world outside. I mean, you've got this uh, porn producer who is probably not a nice guy. Um, you've got all this stuff going on that's not great. And they find this sort of safe space, which is candy colored. And, you know, they get to, like you said, they get to be winners in that in that space and they get to own that. Yeah, it's so clever. I mean, they they also use the sort of, you know, l- like the Coen brothers do, there's always double meanings and triple meanings and entendres, you know, so they, they there's the visual pun, you know, that they uh, do, you know, to, uh, let's just say to touch on the sort of crisis of masculinity and fear of castration in the film, they're certainly not lost on the bowling ball, bowling pin <laughs> symbolism there. We have the sort of Busby Berkeley, yeah. you know, slash, you know, um, ring cycle <laughs> drama <laughs> that, that plays out. I, I'm also very taken uh, with the use of the word, with, with how much they talk about rolling, you know, uh, they, 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 they call, they call uh, bowling, you know, they say we don't roll <laughs> or we oh, don't right, yeah. or whatever. But it's funny because, you know, again, in a film about action or inaction or a film about achievement or non-achievement, you know, like you think about, there's another context where you could say let's roll and then like parachute out of a helicopter, you know, or something like that. Like that's, that's what you, um, you, the dirty dozen might say it, you know? Um, so it's this sort of other, you know, there's a sort of double meaning there, which is, this is what it means for them, you know, or this is how they've kind of, you know, a, a adopted that. I think that we are going to give the last comment of the night. Well, let's go back to Gus. Gus, looking forward to hearing your, your thoughts. Okay, well, how about uh, we bring up the uh, Jesus character, uh, John Tutoro. Uh, you know, I think like despite what we just said about the bowling alley being this respite or almost like, uh, you know, kind of like a sanctuary, he's kind of like a demonic character, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, the way his tongue comes out and <laughs> licks the, ball, the bowling ball and, uh, uh, you know, he's... You know, I don't know. He's a pederast, apparently, according to Walter. And so, uh, you know, again, there's this uh, weird uh, kind of a twist on the sexuality aspect of things. So I was wondering if you'd comment uh, on his thing. And by the way, if you need a toe, I can get it for you, Jacob. <laughs> Thanks, Gus. <laughs> I need it by 3 p.m. <laughs> With polish. <laughs> what do you think about um, John Turturro as Jesus Quintana? Oh yeah, well, that, I mean, that is a good point. When I when I said the outsiders coming together, I didn't have him in him mind. He is a, I think, demonic character, but I think he's a another example of how the Coen brothers are comfortable with taking something that's horrible and some a character who's terrible. And I mean, in this this is my opinion. I think that you sort of sap the strength from. Uh, from evil by showing it to be ridiculous. And I think that that, to me, that's what they're doing with that character. Um, You know, if you sit down and you think, you know, they call him a pederast. And so if you sit down and think about that um, in the same way that you think about uh, the women being exploited in the the porno uh, industry that's going on and all the other things, if you actually sit and think about what would this look like in the real world, I mean, it leads, it, it's an avenue to horror, but the Coen brothers are 
after something else, I think. And I think that's, they, they show a character, they're okay with showing a character like that and just ridiculing them. And, you know, in a way we get to see if, if the dude wins with his team, you know, they get to, you know, triumph over him in a certain way. But, but it is one of those things. It's a litmus test for uh, how you, you know, how you receive the Coen brothers. I can't imagine this character being portrayed in this, this way now, to be honest. Uh, I, I may be wrong about that, but. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, you know, he also, we also see just a lot of the Cone's tricks there, you know, this sort of juxtaposition of like, um, right, something sort of horrible, something kind of funny, um, but also the sort of like um, outrageous and ostentatious with the sort of mundane, you know, I, I, I really like the, um, or I really think the sort of pair of uh, Jesus Quintana and Liam, his yeah. partner, is like, <laughs> <Most likely. laughs> really funny. And there's like a really funny scene where they're both like polishing their bowling balls and mm -hmm. like uh, John Tortura is doing this like hilarious power stance and his sort of, you know, dumpy uh, uh, <laughs> partner is like kind of doing his version <laughs> of it too as they're like, you know, polishing the bowling balls. You know, but we also see that this 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 is really this bowling alley is really their universe. I mean, and within it they have <laughs> they have their rivals, they have their big bads. You know, um, <laughs> uh, it, it, it sort of um, is a counterpoint to the sort of drama and the bads that um, the dude and company encounters. They sort of uh, are drawn into the outside world and explore some of the other sort of strange goings on in L.A. So. Ah, oh, my goodness, look at the time. Uh, my friends, we have come to the hour uh, and then some a little bit, uh, which I'm afraid means that it is time to bring our conversation to a close. Wish we could keep talking. Uh, great film, great conversation as always. So I wanna thank you guys for that. Let me note too that this is in fact our final session of the season before we break for the summer. So if you want to uh, stay in the loop and receive updates about our Film Studies Online discussion series, the best thing to do is to join our mailing list, which you can do at brynmarfilm.org. Now, just because the online discussion series is gonna be on hiatus for the summer, doesn't mean that education programming is coming to a halt. Uh, far from it. Coming up over the next few weeks, we'll be doing in-person seminars on a number of classic films. That includes the so-called Citizen Kane of horror movies, The Wicker Man. Oh, that's coming up this Thursday. We also have Jean Renoir's The Rules of the Game coming up on June 6th, another classic film. And in the next few days, we're going to be announcing our new special programming schedule. Uh, that includes many more education offerings to get you through the summer. And we have new releases, of course, too. Uh, this Friday, we're going to be opening the new Tech World satire, BlackBerry, which is about the titular mobile device, its rise and fall. Um, I've seen it, and I can assure you that it is much funnier and much more engaging than a film about a smartphone has any right to be. Uh, that is just one of several titles currently playing at Bryn Mawr Film Institute. So let me close by encouraging you all to become a BMFI member if you haven't done so already. Uh, we are a nonprofit member supported theater. And so if you enjoy what we do, well, it's a great way to show your support. It really helps us and it helps you too. Membership comes with all sorts of per perks, including serious discounts on movie tickets and education classes and much more beyond that. So again, please visit us at brynmarfilm.org to learn more. Well, Tom, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Appreciated your commentary. Yeah, thanks a lot. It was a lot of fun. And to my friends out there, thank you too. I hope you have a great evening and we'll see you at the movies.